again, thank you so much for taking the time, you know, to chat and consider this a chat, a conversation. It's not, <laughs> not an interview. It's not okay, so no problem. For me. So um well so you are the first Jamaican American to be um appointed mayor, right? Of Highland Park, New Jersey. The first one. The first one. The first yeah. Jamaican. Yeah, the me... first black. Yes. Yes. And you have made history then. I mean, I have. Yes. Seriously. So how does that make you feel? I mean, <laughs> Hmm. Oh, big shoes. <laughs> Lots of responsibility. Um, lot, lot of work ahead of me. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. It, it, it feels good to have accomplished this feat. Um, not just to be the first African American or the first Black person to to fill these shoes, mm. but to know that um, you have a town that is supportive enough because it's only seven percent African American that live in my town. Ah. But then to know that you have the support of everyone else that has yeah. the confidence in you that you can do the job. So now, so tell me a little bit about your journey. I mean, uh -huh. <laughs> when did you migrate to the United States? And, you know, and actually, what were your first impressions? <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. That's a good one, because um, migrating to the United States in the early 70s, Oh. I came here as a teenager and went to high school and everything else. And my little cousin said it the best. When we came here, we, we moved to Newark and it was just after the race riots that was oh. happening here. Yes. Which we had no clue. Yes. No clue. Because when we're living in Jamaica, everybody's the same. No matter who you are, you're black, white, Chinese, Indian, yes. you're Jamaican. Jamaican. You don't know. Jamaican. You don't know. We're Jamaican first. That's we don't right. see um, white, black, Asian. This we don't see the labels. Yes. And then we're thrust into this community where, when we're back home, and these same people come to Jamaica, they they treat us all the same. So we didn't mm -hmm. see the difference. Yes. And then you come here, and then there's this great divide, and you're like, "What the heck is this?" Yes. And then you're you're thrown into where you're into this great divide, and then you you're the first time I knew I was black per se. Not that I didn't know I was black. It was when it was visible, pointed out to me that you're black, he's white. This is, and then the great divide started happening. Yes. yes. My little niece said it the best. Mm. She said, where is the America I see on TV? I want to go to that America. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, that's profound. Truly. Yes, yes. And she was like six or seven years old, but she wanted to go to the America she saw on TV. Mm. And at that time, coming to the U.S., we all wanted, we all thought that's the America we was going into. Right. Not mm. the America that was the reality the America that they always show around the world and say, this is how father knows best, my three sons, blah, yeah. blah, blah. <laughs> All those shows that told America. us about how wonderful and great America is, you know, the, the, the yes. hometown and, you know, the police were great and they tried to solve problems mm -hmm. and this, that, mm -hmm. the other. So we were looking for that America. Yes. Coming here. And then we came here and it was like, this is not America. Totally different. And that was a shocker. Yes, indeed. But I mean, obviously, you've made it your home. <laughs> you know? I have made it my well, coming from Jamaica, when I came from Jamaica, there was a lot of turmoil back then. It was the time when the guns were coming in, the gangs were coming in, people yes. were coming into private neighborhoods, and they were, you know, destroying and tearing and mm -hmm. crime and violence was rampant. As, right. as, as you yes. may have known, I don't know what time and the might political be. violence. And the yeah. political yeah. violence was yes. the order of the day. And you know, mm -hmm. people took sides and it created chaos and havoc in various communities. And one of them was my community that I lived in. We were scared to go to church or school or anything. Yeah. And you had curfews, you had to be home by a certain time of night, and mm. you know, you heard of violence everywhere. So that's where I was leaving from. Okay. So when I came to the United States and I saw some of that, but moving forward there was an election and Jimmy Carter was going to be elected president. Oh, yes. And I was petrified because I had just left this war torn for lack of a better term mm. situation where political violence was rampant. You didn't feel yes. safe. 
safety was not in one of those things in your preview. Mm. And here it is that you're coming back and you're just getting settled in and you're thinking everything is okay and it's going to be better. Yeah. And an election is called and there was going to be a presidential election. Mm. And then you couldn't tell me anything that we we're not going to go back to the same thing. Exactly. Because that's, that's what you... That's the frame that I, that I came from. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So that i was petrified the entire time because the election was coming i thought it was going to be chopped up with killings this that the other the gangs the violence mm. you know everything that we had left behind i thought mm. in my mind's eye i was going to see the same as that during that time in the 70s for the election the election came the the night my me and my sister we hit because we just, we told our parents and they were like, no, it's not going to happen. So we went and found the attic and we hid in the attic. The next morning I crawled out and I came downstairs and everybody in their bed sleeping. There's no cars on, you know, barely a few cars on the street. Right. No fire, no burning, no nothing. Everything was gone. Yes. So And I, you know, and, and I tell the story that as I sat in my parents' living room and I looked out at the world and see that the world was calm and mm -hmm. there was no chaos and that election went and nobody got killed nobody yeah. got chopped up people had dialogues and then they turn the tv on and as you turn the tv on you see jimmy carter with doing his acceptance speech and yeah. everybody was happy and you know there was no gunshot no this no that mm. It, was, mm. it, just, it, it was it had a profound effect on me when i went off to college I joined the big brother, big sister movement. So you know, uh, I could yes. mentor. I know. So I started mentoring there and it just continued on. And whenever I see injustice or inequity, yes. without even somebody saying it, I just knew it was wrong and I had to speak against it. Mm. So I've always been that that person. That kind of yes, thanks to your Caribbeanness. Thanks to me, yeah, thanks to me. It's very, very Caribbean mm -hmm. because that's who we are. You know, we yes. we have to speak, we have to act, and we really believe in this whole village thing. The next thing that I did was um we were we were looking at women that were going back into the workforce mm. or wanting to go into the workforce that didn't have the appropriate clothes to wear. So we started a clothing drive for women going back into the workforce. Now you're also um, an entrepreneur. Yes. yes, you started yes. your own business, and that yes. is also a very Caribbean <laughs> um, sensibility as well. You know, to do for your on your own. Um, tell me about your your business. It's called All Aunt and Home Homestays, right? A, a, yes. a student, like a housing organization. It's a student housing organization. Um, yeah number of years ago um and it, it started quite accidentally okay <laughs> or maybe it wasn't god's divine plan uh, one of the two accidental <laughs> entrepreneur i like that title <laughs> um we started um with having students i had a, a group of students from france that wanted us to come to stay in the united states for a couple of weeks and yeah. you know to see the u.s live with american yes. families that kind of thing mm. and um Unfortunately, the person that was organizing took the money and ran. Oh, Ow. so we had okay. twenty-two students at Newark Airport with no place to go. Mm. And um, I got a call saying, "And I'm like, can you help?" They was like, "I'm calling because I mm. can you help?" And I was like, "No, I can't help. I don't want to do this." <laughs> students i don't know these students what do you, you mean can you help and so as i'm talking to um to someone and i'm like really i i really can't take this on because i you know i can take maybe one or two mm -hmm. it was like but they, they've been in the airport now for eight hours they're stuck they can't get back on a flight mm -hmm. to france and mm -hmm. you know these kids the parents are panicking and I had a woman call me and she was speaking French and she was rapidly speaking a little bit, very little English, but mostly yeah. French. And, yeah. and I had a friend of mine who spoke fluent French and I called him up and I said, Reverend Johnson, I need your help. Mm. And he worked in Democratic Republic of Congo. So he was able to get on the phone and translate to what, incidentally, he was the first Jamaican missionary to Congo. Is that right? Yes, yes. He's no longer with us, but he did some phenomenal work over there. Yeah. And um, I reached out to him and he said, yes, you know, I can help you. And, you know, he translated what she was saying. And 
At the end of the story, there were 22 kids stranded at Newark Airport. No food, they're hungry, they need a home. And they wanted me was to help. So I went to my Rolodex because we had Rolodex at the time. Oh, yes. And I started I calling people. <laughs> Yeah, before the phone and this and that. Yeah. And I started calling folks and I was able to source um, homes for these young people to stay wow. and have people yes. to go pick them up and, you know, that kind of thing. And mm. I ended up with keeping um, six of them at my home because, of course, I had a teenage son and my teenage son, of course, he's a teenager. He wants to yeah. be connected. To teenagers. Absolutely. So it, it worked out where we were able to house and house them locally and to mm -hmm. find things for them. Right. And um, then after they left and they, you know, got this glowing report, then people started calling me out of the blue from France going, ah, oh, we're sending our kids and we want our kids to stay with you. And can you help?